Killing her was easier than living with her ever was. Maybe that's a bit harsh. Ever was. That's the whiskey talking. We had grand times, many great and memorable days. There, that better. Assuming, of course, that she is, in fact, dead. I could go back into the dining room now for a refill and find her not there, vamoosed, gone shopping. It wouldn't surprise me, not after the last few months. I could find myself staring at the bloody but vacant rug where I left her a mere rigor mortis of hours ago. My face like Peter Lorre, knowing no one could help him now, not even Rick. My intention was certainly to kill her. That said, it's not a subject I'd given any serious thought to before. Chem clean day. Helen always liked to give our special anniversaries a name, a little quirk of hers. And it is kind of a special occasion, isn't it? Killing the wife? For instance, the day we were first introduced by mutual friends, Helen called that journey's end. Our first meal out together, the breaking of bread. So on with our engagement, wedding, even the birth of our son, Ronan. So I think it's safe enough to say that this fratricide, is that what they call it? I think so. It sounds right somehow. This fratricide business is right up there with all the other special occasions. Not an event that one is likely to forget in a hurry. The final annihilation of my beloved wife, Helen, by me, Peter Beckett, her... Hmm. What exactly am I? Now, I mean, her murderer, I suppose. Or her beloved murderer because I was still her husband until fairly late last night, and we did, as I said, share many tendernesses. Beloved. Makes one think inevitably of funerals and obituaries. Deeply regretted by her beloved husband and family. Regretted? Yes, it's true. Darling, for what it's worth, I regret that you are, that you simply had to become deceased. Her beloved husband deeply regrets having murdered the deceased. Deeply murdered by her beloved husband whose family regrets. <laughs> At any rate, the thing was easy, as I say, so much so that I wonder why I didn't do it before. But that kind of thinking is deceptive. It was easy because I was ready. And in a sense, so was Helen. Ready to finish it, I mean. Ready to concede that the game was up and just let go. Not struggling and resisting and trying to cling on no matter what. Screaming and pleading and generally making the whole thing as ghastly as possible for everyone. Which, in fairness to Helen, she did not do. She was always very practical. <laughs> in some respects. In other ways, she was... It's such a tiresome cliche, I know, but she was very controlling. I used to wonder if she had done a PhD before I met her, a master's in control, followed by a brilliant doctorate on willful husbands and how to manage them. <laughs> Though her obsessive behavior covered various aspects of our life together, she majored in controlling what I wore. I couldn't even pick out a necktie to wear to dinner, but she would start. <laughs> Does that tie quite go with the shirt I picked up in Dundrum for you yesterday, darling? Show me first which jacket you're planning to wear. Not that frightful tweed thing I gave to Mrs. Watsit's charity store, because I know you retrieved it. <laughs> I'd pour myself a large slush of whiskey and read the newspaper in my underwear until my correct attire was laid out on the bed for me. And if she took too long about it, another slosh. Slosh? 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 Yes, darling, lovely combination, darling. Our son, Ronan, had the dominant gene too. I liked him, loved him even until he was about 12, at which point he became obnoxious beyond belief. <laughs> That's the only word for it. The change from sweet, adoring, affectionate son to sullen, boorish, angry young man was so rapid, I still think someone did voodoo or he joined an internet cult or something. 
from yes daddy, no daddy, three bags full daddy, suddenly in the space of it seemed like a week there were just two ways to do everything, his way and the wrong way. <laughs> he didn't lick it off the stones. I argued furiously with him, mostly over things I couldn't have given a curse about six months earlier. I even got him in a headlock one day for cheating at chess. <laughs> My 15 year old son in a headlock. Yet what mere months earlier had seemed unthinkable now seemed normal, even necessary. I guess I just had a pain in my balls with it all. <laughs> Is that a defence? My balls ached, Your Honour. <laughs> <laughs> you have my sympathy, case dismissed. <laughs> anyway, he was still living in my house under my roof. Of course, he told Helen when she came in that evening, saved all his tears like a big fucking baby till he heard her key in the door. Mary, Daddy tried to strangle me! <laughs> Then arms around each other and off upstairs with the pair of the mean old daddy, bad, bold papa, a quick flash of the evil eye before she vanished. But he was cheating. I kind of gave myself a bit of a fright though on that occasion and I tried to be nice to both of them, I really did. I thought I could make everything like it used to be. Before it all just became unbearable, unendurable. I got tickets, good tickets for bands, groups that he liked. I even resisted telling him they were talentless mutants, charlatans, posers. I told him the ring through his nose really suited him. I accompanied him to the overextended effects driven commercials that he referred to as movies. I even went so far as to watch wretched football with him, partially standing when anyone scored the way they do. I thought we could make it all like before when most weekends we'd go fishing up out together before dawn. Mostly we caught nothing but the joy of showing him different knots, letting him use the big fish knife, answering his endless questions. And it never seemed to matter what I said in reply, he just gulped it all down like I was God Almighty. But it was no use. It seemed the more I tried to befriend him, the more he resented me. He wanted something else, something I apparently no longer had to offer. He discovered I had feet of clay. Jesus, did I need reminding. The fact of the matter is, I wasn't having too good a time of things either. But I didn't think Ronan would take too kindly to me telling him that his father was feeling unfulfilled. That I wanted out of my work, that it was a sham and a waste of time. That I would find some other way to keep him supplied with deadly runners and wicked PlayStation games. That at a time when I wanted to do less, to begin, finally, to ease myself out of the vat of molasses that I called a career, the capitalist pigs I worked for wanted to squeeze the last few drops of plasma out of me. I hated it and everyone in it and had done for years. I'd hit rock bottom so often I felt like a bungee jumper on a rope that was too long. The up times got shorter, the crashes got harder. And over time, the measures got bigger. After repeated requests from Helen, I eventually agreed to go and speak to a doctor. When I got back, there was an urgency about her. Like we had to beat some unspecified deadline. She couldn't even wait for me to get my coat off, never mind pour myself a shot. Well, well what? Don't be an arse. What did the doctor say? Oh, the doctor. Well, you know the little gland that produces happy hormones? It appears mine is fucked. <laughs> I knew I was being a pig, but I couldn't help myself. Of course, part of me wanted to embrace her, to thank her for still caring about my miserable little life, to say that together we would conquer anything, that we would be a stronger family at the end of it all, and that come this summer, the three of us would be running along the beach, stretched out in a line, holding hands like geeks at Disneyland, laughing our fake tanned asses off. <laughs> but all that came out of me was poison. She persisted calmly, like she was trying to comfort someone that was impaled on a metal spike, trying not to panic them, trying not to let them see how bad it was. Did he prescribe something? Her patience was bewildering. No. 
But I did. <laughs> I was already pouring a measure. She sank against the door frame, like a proud animal feeling the first wave of a tranquilizer dart. I could see her eyes fill as I drank. Even then I could have salvaged something. I could have put the glass down and offered some consoling words, but I had, as my old teachers used to say, the devil in me. Instead, I asked her if she'd care to join me. I topped up again and poured one for her, and when I looked back, she was gone. More for Daddy, I said to the empty door. I heard her on the phone to one of her many sympathetic divorced friends, arranging for Ronan to go away with them for a few days to some overpriced spa. Main Street was being cleared for a showdown. A consensus was reached that the source of the conflict in our once happy home was me. Naturally, I disagreed. We all dug in. The vocabulary of our household started to evaporate. There was a kind of reversal of linguistic evolution. We snarled and snapped at each other like hungry hyenas. We screamed, and if that didn't work, we threw things, cursing merrily all the while. It wasn't all bad. Dysfunction gets a lot of bad press, but I find it has its charms. By this time, Ronan only communicated with me by banging doors. One bang meant no, a very loud bang meant you're a right cunt to have for a father. <laughs> Repeated loud bangs meant, I don't know, fuck off and die, I suppose. <laughs> Whatever the young people had agreed on is the ultimate insult that week. Or that other old chestnut I never asked to be born. He read a lot, mostly angry books, judging by the covers I saw, things with slayer in the title and depictions of ritual disembowelment on the covers. Those days he entered and left the house like the grim reaper, all in black. The mercury would drop. If I challenged him, which I only did if I was really suffering, he would tell me I was an emotional retard who didn't know shit. He actually used that expression once, emotional retard. I almost laughed, thinking how my own father would have sent me spinning across the room with an unannounced box in the lug for less. But Helen insisted on protecting him administering life-threatening doses of counselling. Their private talks, as they like to call them, could go on for hours. It never seemed to make one whit of a difference as far as I could see. He was still a dour little prick. <laughs> I pointed this out to Helen when she visited the kitchen for supplies. There's a reason for everything, she said, with as much ice as she could manage. Of course, dear, I said. And the reason in this case is this. You and your endless stream of half-baked American psychobabble have turned our son into a very needy cabbage. Why didn't he just go and join a band or something? Drive around Europe in an old Volkswagen, smoking ganja until he gets all this indulgent shit out of his system. I know he doesn't actually play anything, but since when has that mattered? I could always just nip out and buy him a top-of-the-range drum kit. And he does have a slightly infected nose ring. That's a bit rock and roll, isn't it? Then Helen would be off, delivering a synopsis of all the psychology books she'd ever read. She'd read virtually nothing else for 10 years. So this generally took some time. How-to books. How to make a spoiled, self-obsessed cabbage cuddly again. <laughs> I allowed myself one shot for every 10 minutes of her jaded pseudo-intellectual crud. By the end of some of her longer presentations, I was so pissed I was even beginning to agree with her. <laughs> I would have just settled for a conversation, really, about anything. But it was too late for that. She was just so delighted at being able to wrap it on uninterrupted that she'd forget to turn on her sloshometer. Then she'd realise what was really happening and give another presentation, this time on responsible drinking, linking parental alcohol abuse with teenage detachment and depression. What the fuck does he have to be depressed about? He hasn't spent 25 years working in a cunting fucking job with a bunch of brainless cretins. I was halfway through my second bottle now and firing on all cylinders. You are out of control, she said as a parting shot. Well, if this was being out of control, I liked it. Helen had given me a gift of a set of pewter liquor measures one Christmas, but I still preferred my own slosh measure. Of course, this irked her too, because the whole point of the gift of the measures was to monitor and control how much I drank. Is that your fourth measure of whiskey? No, darling, no, this is still the first, first big slosh of the day, dear. Cheers. By the way, 
Is that your first pair of ridiculously overpriced high heels today, hmm? <laughs> Well, it was only fair. I had to have some little comfort after a mauling from those two. They could just slip off for private chat and chamomile tea, or if they were feeling really reckless, hot chocolate and marshmallows. So I had to have a little comfort too, a little whiskey and venom. If they were huddled in a debriefing session after a, a dogfight, I had to recognise the no-fly zone of the whole upstairs of the house. My fucking house! And stay downstairs. So at least I deserve that much. Besides, I never heard Helen asking him, is that your fourth spliff of the day, dear? <laughs> I know he was having a little dope here and there. I nearly asked him for someone I couldn't face a cure. I don't wish to speak ill of the deceased or the dearly murdered. But the fact is she might not be deceased now if she hadn't been so intent on having everything her own way. If she'd left me alone, I could be the one who was dead. I could be, easily. I had the makings of a perfectly good alcoholic, but I was thwarted by my wife's obsession with moderation. With me out of the way, she and Ronan could have had a great time. They could have had evenings of hot chocolate and psychology for the limp-minded, for all the divorced bitches in the neighbourhood. Anyway, that's pretty much how the house proceeded over the last few weeks. Me getting loaded in the sitting room, conducting Rachmaninoff. Ronan up in his bedroom, applying disinfectant to his inflamed nostril, and Helen sobbing and fretting in the kitchen, or upstairs, trying to remove the caterpillars of self-doubt that were destroying Ronan's brain. People stopped calling. Not just friends, salesmen, charity chuggers, gutter replacers, Mormons, grass cutters. Even the beggars who offered to say, Hail Mary for your trouble, for fuck's sake, even they passed us up. Ronan left to go and live for a while with his friend Tucker. Where do they get the fucking names? <laughs> Though he wasn't the worst of the friends I saw. Things went fairly badly downhill for me and Helen after that. The gloves were off, the buffer was gone. The fact is, I can't really remember very much about the last two weeks. Being sick, yes, bad, very bad mornings. Vomiting like I was dying. Sometimes I would look up from the basin and I would see Helen walking away from me like she'd been watching me all the time. I guess by then her patience was all used up and she didn't want to call the ambulance too soon and have them resuscitate me. Then I'd start to settle, feel not so bad and get primed again. The more out of control I was, the more Helen wanted world domination. I guess maybe it was her way of dealing with the chaos. She hated chaos. Untidy rooms, untidy thinking, untidy lives, clothes that didn't match. As if somehow she could make sense of the mess that is life by putting everything into a filing box and numbering it. Everything would be okay if you just made sure that red and orange never came together in the same outfit or ensemble. From this time on, it was fairly clear to both of us that this would be some kind of battle to the death. All communication ceased. The house was still. It was almost pleasant. One day I came in from the off license and there was a man I'd never seen before in the sitting room. He rose and introduced himself as Brian. I told him I was tired and asked him to fix whatever it was he was supposed to fix and be on his way. When he stood up, I noticed his clothes really sharp. Does my wife dress you too, I asked. <laughs> he didn't get it, but at least in his confusion, he stopped smiling. I was making for the hall when Helen headed me off and led me back into the sitting room. Brian was a counsellor. 
I told him my wife and son are both counsellors and if they couldn't fix me, he didn't have a hope. That got rid of her off looking for tissues. I tried to explain to him why he mustn't smile because if she thought we were having a laugh, she'd fire him. He didn't get that either. So then he told me all about being a gambler and a drinker and there was something else as well, I can't remember now, and about how this girl he had met had helped him to be strong enough to build a new life. I offered him a drink to celebrate. Does she let you pick your own neckties, this girl of yours? Oh, God, yes, he laughed. If it helps me get through another day feeling OK about me, then that's cool with Sue. I asked him if they had a good sex life. Affirmative again. Did they have shared interests? Lots of things. The cinema, hill walking, live music, the whole shooting gallery. It all sounds pretty fantastic, Brian. Yes, it is. And you could have a life like that, too. You just need to make some decisions, that's all. Decisions? Yes. Take a hard, honest look at what's bad in your life and get rid of it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's when it came to me. This counsellor called Brian whom my wife had introduced me to, really has to take the credit. <laughs> it was a true epiphany. If I could just get rid of Helen, kill her, my life would start to improve pretty much straight away. The drinking was a non-issue. When I looked for a pattern, the only one I could find was when I was being made to wear whatever Helen thought looked well on me, eating whatever Helen thought looked good on the menu, and talking to whoever Helen thought was rather splendid and witty. And of course, Helen herself was never too far away either. My beloved, throwing her pretty head back to laugh hysterically at whatever inane drivel passed for wit or intelligent conversation among her coterie of smug interior designer fuckwit friends. Them and the self-actualization coaches, Jesus shooting me daggers if I happened to mention to one of her designer cronies that I thought that was rather a lot to charge someone for helping them to choose a tin of paint. Or I might have added in Brian's case, not nearly enough to charge them for giving them the truly magnificent idea of wasting the wife. As it so happens, Helen paid Brian for that the only session I ever had with him. It's almost like she had some kind of death wish when you really think about it. <laughs> I mean to say, she introduced me to the man who gave me the idea to murder her. <laughs> In hindsight, it should really have been me who paid Brian for that session. <laughs> <laughs> At least I could have given him a tip. <laughs> So in Helen's own parlance, my meeting with Brian was chem clean day. The day that set these momentous events in motion and fucked for all time the good Persian rug and whatever time remains of my own life. If this were Cluedo, it would go something like this. The husband did it in the dining room with the rolling pin, which incidentally surpassed all his expectations, he never having used one before. <laughs> The only additional cost incurred was a bottle of whiskey. Okay, two bottles of whiskey. Safe in the knowledge that good old Brian would not get to hear about this last bender. He had promised himself that this was strictly a one-off, both the murder and the whiskey. Anyway, after last night, this morning, whatever, he'd have no further need of booze. I can't say for sure if she ever actually said the words, you can't win. But I started to imagine her saying them, increasingly towards the end, between gulps. You can't win, slosh. You can't win, slosh. So much so that I made sure that these were the last words she ever heard before she slipped away. I said it in her ear, up really close. Stinking of whiskey wearing a pink shirt and a purple tie. Just a whisper, like a close-up in a movie. I know she understood me as well, near dead and all as she was, because her fingers stopped scratching at my sleeve, and she was quite still, not dead, listening. 
after all that, finally fucking listening. I know the moment she checked out and this was not it, no, this was a lucid moment, a moment for her to realise finally the error of her ways. I even smiled at her to confirm that what she was now beginning to twig, too late, alas, was indeed the heart of the matter. That she could be still moving around our splendid house, admiring herself in the full-length mirror in our bedroom, Ironing creased things smooth, dusting, arranging luncheon engagements, preparing to shop, anything she wanted. Instead of lying there on the good Persian rug, creating chaos, ruining order, mixing red with orange, for fuck's sake! <laughs>